Now, well, what you got to do is get as much of what you know on paper so you don't forget it, don't write it, so you don't forget to write about it. And so I want you to think a sec. Just think a sec. What were the causes of the revolution? Just think. The people, events, places. They were this. They just think a sec, and we're just going to go right through the room, and we're just going to give a bunch off. And that's what you do. You literally just jot it down, and you can use abbreviations. I want you to do this, but it's for you. But the thing is, that will trigger memory, so you get stuck in your essay. Because it's so easy to forget things in your essay once you start writing. You don't have to write down. Just, just think about it. Just think about it right now. Can I go first? No. <laughs> go first. Um. The Revolution, uh, Boston Massacre. Boston Massacre is a good one. You might have another one. Slavery. Huh? Slavery. slavery would work. Yeah, the issue about slavery, yes. T yeah, good. good. Um, Clock's running, Dexter. Uh, Very good. Uh, <laughs> huh? Sad fact. Okay, British involvement. What, and what's the economic policy? Remember? The, the economic policy of the British. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> new war, yes. Quartering out. I was gonna say but it's There's a lot of stuff. I know. I just thought more of them. Name an act, an event, a person. Sugar act works. Yes. Now you're looking. I know they did. There's like a thousand more. First battle of the Revolutionary War. What was the body that was created? That first Congress. It was something. Heck, who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Yeah, that's one. Huh? <laughs> yes. Saratoga. Now it's a little bit after, but all in the works of French style. Yeah. Townsend Acts works. Very good. You can do Continental Congress, the Olive Branch Petition, Lexington and Concord, <coughs> the Quebec Act, the Currency Act. You said the French and Indian War, did you? Treaty of Paris, 1763. Proclamation of 1763. Pontiac's Rebellion. What's that? Oh, yeah. Sam Adams, John Adams. Very good. We mentioned Jefferson, James Otis, King George III. All of those are things you get down. You jot them down. And once you start writing it, it does trigger memories. It's one of those things like, okay, I gotta do this. Once, oh yeah, okay, I remember. And also when you start thinking more about your essay, and also you might not even be on your list, but you remember stuff. It really does work. So use abbreviations, get things down, jot down as quickly as possible. Let me give you an example of this. This is one of a similar question that I made up just to show you. And it's <coughs> the Berkeley tale that's on cost revolution. What's going on in that picture? Elvis is meeting Dixon. So Here's one I made up, and I made a huge brainstorm list. Don't, no, I just want to give you an idea of all the stuff we could put down. And what you do is you divide your, your paper up. One side, you have a bunch of stuff. So navigation acts, you got all that stuff. By the way, the numbers I put down, what do the numbers mean? Yeah. You don't necessarily need to do that. I just did that as an example. But the thing is, it's, um, just get stuff down. Because it's so easy to forget stuff. And then I, so policy and mercantilism helped lead to the American Revolution. Thesis, British attempts again economic subservience of the colonies, led to the policy of mercantilism. So I had economic subservience, this policy, they tried to get a subservient colonies. That's my position. And then the uh, British tried to enforce after 1763, leads to rebellion. So I have mercantilism, and I list down some of the facts. The first attempt, and I just wrote down Grenville to remind myself to write about Grenville, which is the uh, Stamp Act. And then, Rebellion. Yeah, I know, I put a lot of stuff in there. You really basically need about two or three packs for us, per paragraph. I put down a lot. I mean, yeah, you can have more. If you have a four paragraph essay, 
put one or two more facts in each paragraph because it's shorter. Does that make sense? Now, I'm giving you the flexibility, but the thing is, get as much information as, as you can. And to get that strong thesis statement, as long as everything in that paragraph goes back to the topic sentence, which is in the thesis, you've done it. And there you have the facts, you start to think about it again, it makes it easier. So if you do this real quick, before an essay, you'll get it. Now, I, I made it, I wrote it out, you can use abbreviations, just a few words. All this is just triggering memories for yourself. So let me give you another example and show an outline. You want to see another example? Here's the question. Evaluate the following statement. Dogs are the best pet. Right? Everyone think about it? So you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, or kind of agree with half, you know, say dogs are great, but you know, so are our cats, right? Well, I give you my example, what I did. As you can see, dogs are the best pet. And what I wrote down very simply, dogs have many liabilities. Yet, dogs have many liabilities. Yet, due to their intelligence and independence, cats are the spirit of pet. <laughs> I made that very clear. <laughs> right? That's my thesis statement. My paragraphs are, of course, dog liabilities, because you have to address dogs. Even if you disagree with it, you've got to mention dogs. Does that make sense? Because it's in the question. And then intelligence and independence, cats. So, liability to dogs. You can't drive. Have you smelled dog's breath? Have you smelled dog's breath? They're all moochers. Think about cats. The best part about cats, you know, they, they love chess. They're great strategic minds. And then independence. They read, you give them a book, cat draws by brother. Huh? They know how to use kitty litter. I didn't know how to use kitty litter until I saw a cat do it. Dog, they look at litter and eat it. Because they're moochers. That's why they have bad breath. Don't. Fear rabbits. That's another one, right? No, it's a very basic outline. Now, what? Yeah, cats get better jobs. Cats actually make money for families. Do the math. What? Your yeah. Cats feed you. Here's another thesis, and you can do that. Okay. Dog, I answer the question, right? First paragraph, intelligence. Second, loyalty. Third, artistic skills. Yeah, dogs are, dogs, I gotta admit, if you don't too close because of a bad breath, dogs are fine. <laughs> Example of an outline. So when you do your essay in class, not gonna be this Monday, but the upcoming Monday, that's what you're gonna have to have. I'll let you have that. You can bring that into class. A brainstorm and an outline. And you'll turn it in with your essay. You can bring that in. Because I'm giving you the essay question now. Actually, you get three choices. Pick four of them. And have five outlines. Pick one. Of the three. <laughs> so I'm like, four. Okay. Well, this one is hard. Pick one of the three essay questions. I originally was just going to have two. That's how to give you all my choice. It's not next Monday, but the Monday after. Fifth. And it says on here, the fifth. I gave you a small sheet of paper. Why did I give you a small sheet? So you can be responsible. Now that is the that is the assignment, <coughs> and we'll talk a little bit about today. But that's also you're reading a chapter seven, so it's in the book, and it's also in the video we're going to watch next week. Does that make sense? So I will give you some information today, and then I'll be reading. And then the other ones we talk more in class about. So that's why I gave you three choices. Pick how many? Pick one of them. Answer one of them. All right, let's go take a note then. And let's finish up. We got a few things to finish up. Let's finish up.
Oh, by the way, so I've gone through this stuff. I spent a long time on basis statements. I spent a long time on essays. When we get to DBQ, a document-based question, we'll get to it in a couple weeks. It's the, it's the same question, but the same format. You just have to use not just your own information, but also some documents as evidence. So I'm not going to go back through this again. All right. So we got right to yeah, slave power. So we got three fifths compromise and slave power. Let me get to the last compromise, and it was about commerce. Just really quick. And the commerce was this. Madison and others realized the need that the federal government, the government, must regulate trade. International trade and interstate trade. That's commerce means trade. Interstate trade was one of the big the trade between that. That was a real problem. But Southern representatives were really worried that this regulation of trade might affect the slave trade. Not just the international slave trade, but the interstate slave trade, which was big business. And so the compromise was this. They agreed Congress could do this. They could do that. So, so the Congress has the power to regulate international trade and interstate trade, interstate commerce. Congress passes law, the executive enforces it. The slave trade would not be touched for 20 years. Congress cannot touch the slave trade. And what a lot of slaveholders, including men like Madison, thought, in 20 years, slavery will be gone. That pernicious institution will be gone, and we can move on. And so, those are the compromises. And it was a lot of give and take, but when they came out with it, they came out with a document that they believed covered most of the bases and it gave that strong central government as a republic. It's not a democracy and nothing like it. And so they added one more thing. To ratify it would require nine states. Now remember, it required, it re, it required 13 states to ratify the articles. This one, only nine states to totally change the law, which I think is kind of amusing they did it that way. But the big thing is, and they all knew it, when they presented this document, which was kind of quite a shock to the states, they needed three states, really. New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia had to ratify this or it won't work. They're the three biggest and wealthiest states. They have to get it. And these states, therefore, would be the focus of the ratification battle. The fight to ratify the Constitution. Virginia, yeah. And the big thing about this was, yes, there'll be two groups, but one group is gonna have a clear advantage, and it's those who fought for the Constitution. And they're gonna be called the Federalist. Because regardless of the disagreements amongst the Federalists who want the Constitution, they disagreed on a lot. But all they cared about was we got to get that Constitution ratified. So they were focused on one thing. Well, the anti Federalists are all over the place. The anti Federalists are going to oppose it. Now, I have to add one thing the term Federalist come from this new form of government that's called federalism. And that is written into the Constitution. And what federalism means is this. There are clear powers designated for the national government, which is why we call it the federal government, and clear powers for the state government. Basically what it says is the federal government has these powers. The other powers are for the states. So the states still have power. The states still have sovereignty within the state. But the federal government has certain powers and the federal government is supreme. So they have powers 
for the federal government and the state government. That's what federalism means. So there's a tiered power system, federal, state, then local. Almost all the laws that affect you are state laws, virtually all. Federal laws are important, but they don't have near the effect on your life that you do. And then there are city laws, too. They don't affect you, but state laws are the big. And so, with that, that's where you get the term federalism. And the Federalists looked at it very basically. These are what we wanted. This was the advantage. And the advantages were this, that strong central government that could put down rebellions, that had the strength to create an army, that had the strength to have uh, other countries respect it. Also, strong executive. That person that when time, when it's, when, when it, the time is there, it's needed, they can execute the laws and carry it out. Next, they needed the power, and they reminded people about the war, or the battles that people had about trade. It could regulate commerce. Next, it could tax and borrow. Governments cannot function if they can't borrow, and they cannot function if they don't if they can't collect tax revenues because then no one would own the money. They need this. Governments have to be able to borrow. Next, they can control the money supply. They print money and they mint coins. Only the federal government technically can do this. It's complex, but the government creates the currency, and they set the currency. They set the value, or at least have some control over it. You know, the federal government can go back and say, no, we're going to go back to the gold standard if they want right now. So it's only worth the value of this much gold. They have that power. Or do, we're just going to print money, the heck with it. The president, after they gave the president the print, to pretty much coin any money the president wants. So the president could just mint a, a trillion dollar coin if the president wants. Hmm? What's that? Yeah, it's, it's actually an interesting concept in a lot of ways. Next, no democracy. It's a republic. There's not a king. And there's no democracy. The mob will be controlled. We'll have a government of, and that's what they like to say, the government of a better sort. We'll make sure that the people who should be in charge are in charge and not you rabble. This was a major selling point of it. <laughs> oh, and lastly, the Constitution is very flexible. It can be amended. The laws are written relatively broad so they can be adaptable to different situations. Because everybody believed that things would be significantly different down the road. They didn't always think it's going to be constantly 1789. They knew what was happening in Britain. The world was changing. It's called the Industrial Revolution. That was changing everything. So they could see there'll be changes in the documents written to be flexible. And it's difficult to amend, but you can't amend. It requires two-thirds of a vote in both houses of Congress. The president must sign it. And then three-quarters of the states have to agree. So it's hard, but it can't be done. The anti-federalists were all over the place. They had certain reasons to hate it, but they weren't unified. So the federalists had this great advantage. All they could say is, Constitution is good. If you have a problem, the Constitution will handle it. It's flexible enough, we can handle it. Them, the sky's falling. Why? All these reasons. The first big is they feared that strong central government. They feared all the power in one government. They also feared the executive. That one tyrant. And then a more basic fear among some of the states. The states will lose power. If the national government gains power, the states are therefore less important. 
and they could see, they could make all these uh, slippery slope arguments that states will lose power. Next, the power of dual taxation. Basically what it was is they're fearful that they could be, now you're gonna have taxes from the national government and taxes from the state government. And the power to tax is the power to destroy. The government will have that power to tax. They could lay such huge taxes on certain things that they could literally control the economy. Because their argument, that's what the British did and that's what you're going to do. To give you an example, if the government wanted to stop some income stream, they could put an excise tax on it. So put a tax on the sales of anything that sells. So it could be anything. Actually, a very good one would be and people have threatened this, is in some of the states now they're doing legalized marijuana. There's three states that have that. They would put a 1,000% a, a tax, federal tax on the sale of marijuana. So if they sold $100 worth of marijuana, how much tax would they have to pay? $10,000. How long would that business last? Be gone, wouldn't it? Power to tax is already destroyed. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they, they could do that, and they've done that. They did that during Prohibition in the 1920s. Best way to enforce that was put a huge tax on the sale of alcohol. alcohol. Don't pay the tax. Alcohol. <laughs> Next. No Bill of Rights. The British had a Bill of Rights. This was done back in the 16, in 1690, right after the Glorious Revolution, where the British laid down certain rights that all people have. And it's part of the many documents that create the British Constitution. When it says, we need this to make sure tyranny does not happen. Now, Madison would, of course, say, it's implied in the Constitution. We don't need it. But this was a big deal. We need to amend the Constitution to put certain rights down. And lastly, militias. It says in the Constitution that the federal government is responsible for the military and the militia. It's not clear if states could have their own militia. And this was a big issue, especially for southern states. They have to have a strong militia. Why? The fear of slave rebellions. <clears throat> and that is where we get that great work of propaganda that the Federalists would do to pick apart the anti-Federalist argument. <laughs> because there are some people that just feared this. There are some people that, that were scared of the executive. Some just were, didn't want to lose their power. And they're all over the place. And that is where we get the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers was propaganda. Federalist propaganda. Written anonymously, yet everybody knew who wrote it, by three men. Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. He became the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, appointed by Washington. Those three, Hamilton wrote, or Madison wrote the most. And they were meant to point by point refute all the arguments of the anti-Federalists. And they were amazing how prolific they were. They wrote over 100 of them, and they just got them out And that is why we read Federalist Number 10. Because that laid out one of their big arguments. We need a strong government. We need this. Why? We need a republic. No parties. No democracy. Now you look at what was the big deal about parties? The elite was worried that the parties would be based upon class. So you have, what, two parties? It's based on class. Yeah. And which one's going to be bigger? By far. And that's what they feared. And that was all... You're like, oh, well, you know, they'll pass laws that will restrict your economic growth. No, what they're worried about is the poor are going to say, 
we're being cheated. We're working hard and not getting what we deserve, and we want part of this prosperity. That's what they were worried about. That never happened. We don't really have parties based on class. Overall, and this is we'll start with the Industrial Revolution, the Democratic Party, which, which is the Democratic Party today out of, the, out of the Industrial Revolution, is more working man's party to this day. The Republican Party would eventually become the party of the elite, wealthy elite, which it is today, but more of it, but not completely. It's much more, it's not, it's just, Republicans are more elite, wealthy businessmen. The Democrats are more working men, but they still blend in a lot. So that's what they said, and it worked. It worked. Delaware was the first one to ratify it, and then step by step, more states joined. A close fight in Virginia, and that's where Thomas Jefferson comes in. Jefferson, who's back in France, looked at this. He liked parts, as we read in the Tree of Liberty, he's fearful of parts, but this is what Jefferson said. I will not oppose it if you say there'll be a Bill of Rights. And his friend Madison agreed. Madison said, I promise, I vow to you, I will write a Bill of Rights. So everyone got that. Jefferson dropped his opposition. Madison promised a Bill of Rights. And that would get Virginia and Pennsylvania in. New York, Hamilton, and Madison, especially, but those Federalist Papers really helped. And New York finally ratified it. And once that happened, the Constitution was ratified. There are actually three more states that still had to ratify it, but it's pretty much once we got New York, we're in. So Rhode Island would ratify it after the, the election of Washington as president. Next time, well, we don't have any choice now, so we can do it. And the Constitution is ratified. Now, a couple funny things. First off, actually, one funny thing we'll mention now, we'll come back to this. All these arguments that you know they, they thought the government was too strong and they, the executive was too powerful, etc. All of these things were arguments of the anti federalists Yet you hear people all the time today, and this will be for a very long time, will talk about the Constitution. And they will say the Constitution was meant to not be a strong government, not have a strong executive, to have the states have more power, to control taxation. And people say that all the time. They will act like that all the stuff that the anti-federalists feared was really what the Constitution is. They say that all the time. You hear that. You might have heard that. They never, the Constitution was meant to be a weak form of government. No, it wasn't a strong government, not a dictatorship, but a strong republic. And so people say this all the time. Why? Why would they say that to people? Why would they say that the Constitution was meant to be a weak form of government when it never was? In fact, that was the argument against it, that it was too strong. Why would somebody say that? Why? First off. What are they hoping people will do? If I tell you the Constitution was meant to be a weak form of government, that the states were going to be more powerful, what am I hoping you, you believe after I say that? No? What's that? Who should have more power? Yeah. The states should have more power. The federal government should have less power. I expect you not to know these things and believe me. That's what I'm hoping. As people say that might not know. They don't want the federal government to do something, so they'll act like the Constitution said they can't do it. They're manipulating people and they do it all the time. No, it was meant to be a strong form of government. It was really meant to be a strong form of government. Don't forget that. I repeat, it's not a dictatorship, and the states throughout power, so not as strong as it could have been. Well, it passed. 1789, the electoral, it was pretty confusing, they had to do a quick census. They had to do a quick, all this stuff real quick, have a quick election. So 1788 ratified 1789 for the election, but they just had to get this out quick. The electoral college met and they unanimously chose what person to be president. 
and he will be the only unanimous choice for president, George Washington. James Monroe got all but one vote in 1820 because the decision was only Washington should be unanimous so one of the electors voted for somebody else. So everybody else. Now, Hamilton thought, I'm sorry, Madison thought the electoral college would go away once Washington was done. So Washington's first. And Washington basically created the government. There are certain guidelines for the Constitution, but the Constitution is really small. And so Washington had to create a number of precedents. He basically created the office. And a couple pretty basic ones. He's going to be called Mr. President. That might not look like a big one, but is he your highness? And if he's your highness, is that nobility? That was a big decision. You know, people want to call him that, or your excellency. No. The president of the United States is not George. You're not going to label him that. We call him Mr. President. Now, he's still very formal. He still, he would not, for example, shake people's hands. He thought it was more appropriate to bow. Thomas Jefferson would be the first president to shake someone off someone's hands. Uh, out, out, in, a, in a formal meeting. And next, he would serve two terms. He was exhausted. The politics became so nasty by the end of his term, people were calling him a traitor and a monarch, monarchist. He was pro British. It got very weird, very nasty, really fast. He was done. And no president would serve any more until Franklin Roosevelt. A few wanted to serve more. Like the best known, the two best known would be Ulysses S. Grant and Teddy Roosevelt. Next, he set up the cabinet. Now the Constitution says there'll be a cabinet, but Washington created this cabinet. He set the formation. He set the basic uh, ideas of it. He laid it out, and the cabinet. There are five posts, but we need to know four of them. Four of the positions he created, because they're all still here today as part of the cabinet. He created a secretary of state. Now this is copying the British model, and that would be Thomas Jefferson. <clears throat> now originally the secretary of state dealt with affairs within the United States and outside the United States. But now the secretary of state is fully Completely in write this down foreign policy. Every other country has a foreign minister. The United States has the Secretary of State. It's kind of funny. We copied it out to the British Secretary of State, and the British Secretary of State is responsible for affairs within Britain. Ours, foreign affairs. Also, a Justice Department. Now, actually, we call it the Justice today. He created an Attorney General, which was also going to be his lawyer. Now it doesn't, it's now. It's not quite like that. And he picked Edmund Randolph of Virginia. Do you see a Virginia connection? Washington from Virginia. Jefferson from Virginia. Randolph from Virginia. They would soon call it the Virginia dynasty because Washington's from Virginia, Jefferson's from Virginia, Madison's from Virginia, Monroe's from Virginia. Four of the first five presidents would be from Virginia. War. A war department was created and he put Henry Knox, who was his artillerist, in charge of the war department. A little later on, they would create a Navy department under President Adams. Today, well, in 1947, through today, it's combined and that's the Defense Department. And the last one we need to know, Treasury. And the Treasury was a really important one because he had all these problems. And this would become the economic spokesperson for the government. It's more complex than that today. But he chose his aide, Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton's going to have more influence than any other single person in this cabinet. Jefferson would come to hate Hamilton. Hamilton was incredibly smart, scary smart. With a grand, with a mind for, for long term strategic thinking down the road. I'm not saying he's right, but he really thought in advance. He could see things the way that people just didn't see them. 
He mapped things out in his brain. Madison was a, or, I'm sorry, Hamilton was a scary man, the way his intelligence was. He also, because of his intelligence, had a lot of enemies. He was very arrogant about it. Well, that's a cabinet. Next, he also gave, it mentions this in the Constitution, but wasn't clear he would formally do that State of the Union address. State of Address, I'm grabbing right here. The State of the Union address, where he would, he was supposed to, every, the president's supposed to give an uh, end of the year summary. John, or, we're not to the Vietnam War yet. Should we just skip everything in Vietnam War? You can argue, right? right? Yeah. All right, so President Johnson is off talking about this. He's right back there. That's who looks at me every day I teach. Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> well, again, yeah, to get some kind of year in summary, Washington gave, you know, he didn't say it, but what he did is he wrote a speech out, or wrote a letter out, and sent it to Congress. And sent the formal idea of a State of the Union address delivered to Congress. And Congress would read it. Today, the president reads it. It's a big, it's a big uh, television event. Now they made it into this big ceremony. They just kind of all made it up in the last 20 years because of TV. But still, the president reads this. Washington set that precedent. There are other ones, but those are the biggies you need to know. Washington kind of created what our ideal of the president. Oh, all right. Washington is the head of state. The president is not only the executive. Washington gave this idea that the president is also like the symbol of the country. This is actually really problematic for the president. There, there's issues with this. In fact, it's flawed in a lot of ways, and nobody really does this, except the US. Everybody else has somebody else at the head of state. For example, the person who carries out the laws, for the most part, in Britain is the prime minister. Yet their head of state is a queen. Countries like Germany, they have a chancellor that carries out the law, but they elect a separate head of state called the president, who's supposedly away from the political battles about laws, and above the fray. In the US, the president is both. And that's actually kind of problematic. Because they can say, how dare you talk to the president that way when you have a political disagreement with him? Wait a minute, your job is political. And so it causes problems. The very first law they created, the first big law was in 1789, the Judiciary Act. The Judiciary Act of 1789, and that created the federal court system in the Supreme Court. The Constitution is very vague about this, and so it says Congress can create the court system. So Congress creates it's a federal court system, a series of federal courts. We have one in, in Helena, there's a federal judge in Helena. Court of Appeals, which is the next step up, and then the very top of Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court. And Congress decides how many members will be on. They eventually settle upon nine, but they can say 50 if they want. They have that power. So that's the Judiciary Act. And the first capital would be in New York City. And it was a real fight where the capital would be. But here's the key thing. Oh, I almost forgot one of the things. And then Madison, who was elected to the House of Representatives, he did what he promised. He would write a Bill of Rights. Madison would write, and it would be 12 amendments. He would write to the Constitution. That would be was the original Bill of Rights. Only 10 would be ratified at first. So the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments. Actually, uh, an 11th would be ratified 100 or 200 years later. They'd ratify one of Madison's amendments in, in, in the 1990s. The last amendment to be ratified. It's about the pay of Congress. But the Bill of Rights. Now, Mr. Sims, when I'm gone next week, we'll talk, spend uh, some time talking about this. But this laid out the rights. And there's a couple things I do have to get before this. I do have to get these two things. First off, everybody, maybe you haven't read it directly, but you've heard of the First Amendment. 
And you know, most of you have, my guess is. Does anybody know what the first amendment says? Yes, it's something you should know. That's why I said you should know. Yeah, it's something you should know. Have you ever heard that the freedom? You ever said you, you ever heard you, you had a freedom of speech? It, huh? Have you heard that? You haven't heard that? Hmm. Let me read it to you. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for, for redress of grievances. So it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Congress should make no law abridging the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So that's what it means. So, do you have freedom of speech? Yes. No. It doesn't say that. Nowhere does it say anywhere do you have freedom of speech. Do you have freedom of religion? No. Nowhere does it say you have freedom of religion. You're on the right track. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Exactly. So they can't pass a law saying you can't, you can't have, or you can't go to church. They can't say that, or you can only be Catholic. They can't pass that law. But it doesn't mean you can have any religion you want. <coughs> you, know, you just can't. You know, there's, there's restrictions on it. You can't say whatever you want. Period. Nowhere does it say you do not have freedom of speech. Congress just can't pass a law saying that. Like I said, Nick, you cannot speak. You're not allowed to speak. That is unconstitutional. But you can't say what you want. You can't go into a theater that's full of people watching a movie, and because you think it's fun, you scream, Fire, we're all going to die, and watch them panic. You go, ha ha, that was great. Can't touch me, that's my freedom of speech. No, you can't do that. <laughs> you cannot do that. <laughs> it could be a number of things, yeah. And there's certain slander rules and libel rules that you can't write or speak, um, purposely speak um, uh, lies or untruths about somebody, especially if it might mean to harm them. There's all kinds of things. You cannot do this. I mean, for example, there are some religions that claim that polygamy, or what they call plural marriage, was okay. No. You said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Yes. <laughs> and so, that is really important. And the reason I'm telling you this is, everyone got this down. They the, the, the First Amendment says that, but in law, there are what we call gray areas gray areas. No, you do not have freedom of speech. You just can't, that can't just pass a law saying you can't speak. And you might think, well, that's close. Or that's the same thing. It's not the same thing. The Fourth Amendment says there can be no illegal searches or seizures. <laughs> there's gray areas. Unless there's cause. Please, somebody define cause for me. Suspicion. Yeah. And you can drive and what? So that's a loophole you could drive to school for. So there is not absolutes. Second, let me read you the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment. The, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. Madison wrote that for one reason and one reason only. What? Huh? From what? Slave rebellions. He wrote that so there would be state militias to put down slave rebellions. That's why he wrote it. Remember the argument of the anti-federalists. They weren't in the vacuum. 
He wanted this ratified. He promised those slaveholders, you can put down your rebellion. Originally, the Second Amendment finished with people do not need to serve in the militia if they have religious or conscientious, conscientious objections. It actually said you don't have to serve in the militia. Then they crossed that out because they thought that would be too, uh, too broad of a thing. It was all about militias. All about militias. You do not have the right to have arms. Arms are military weapons. Nobody thinks you have that right. Except for a few insane people. And there are those people. You don't have the right to have arms. If you did, you'd have a thermal nuclear bomb in your basement. I think that would be dangerous. <laughs> right? You would get in a fight with somebody and launch your cruise missile out No, you can't do that. <laughs> no. The Second Amendment is about a militia. What is the security of a free state? State. States have militias. Who are the people? It's not individual people. Madison was talking about people. So when people say their Second Amendment rights, what? You want a right to have militias to put down slave rebellions? You have a right. You, you, it's arguably you have a right to have personal weapons, but it's a tenth of them. Powers that are, are ninth and tenth amendments. Rights that aren't rights that aren't listed in there, the people still have. And the tenth um, powers of the state or powers that aren't the federal government's for the states. All right. Last thing. Very quick. Out of this, almost immediately, though, almost immediately, two political parties formed. Almost immediately. Because, yeah, please. No, we're not Whigs yet. That's Britain. The Whigs will be in the U.S., but that won't come until, that's the I hate Andrew Jackson part. And that's coming in the 1830s. Jackson, Jackson represented democracy. The two parties developed. And they developed over different ideas about the direction of the country. And that's something Madison just assumed we'd all agree. No. And the two parties were this. The parties that formed around Alexander Hamilton became known as the Federalists. And they believed in Alexander Hamilton's ideas. Now, I'm sorry about this. Federalists who wanted the Constitution, that's only for the ratification battle. When the ratification battle ended, the Federalists who wanted the Constitution and the Anti-Federalists who were against it, those went away. Now we have a new political party, the Federalist Party. And then we have the Republican Party. Yes. Jefferson and Madison. Before you go, let me have one more time. I know the bell rang, I'm sorry. Now you're going to read about this in your chapter, you see it in the video, but the big thing is this. Hamilton thought the future of the country would be manufacturing and commerce. Cities. Wait, last thing. Jefferson, this is Jefferson and Madison. Agrarian agriculture. That's no agrarian. Sorry. Agrarian agriculture. Sorry I went after the bell. Now you have those questions. Mr. Sims will be here for a week and he, he's going to talk about the, more about the Bill of Rights and other things. And he really knows the stuff. He was a great teacher. And when you get back, oh, there'll be a quiz over chapter seven on Tuesday. And I'll ask you a couple questions about the Constitution for two short ideas. The Speaker of the House is actually used to be called in the, in the Continental Congress and the Confederation Congress, they call it the President. They, it, it's just the person, but now because there's a president, they, they try to call that the executive, they call him the Speaker. And what the Speaker of the House does is that's the person who it's the majority party, they pick them. And they're the ones who set, who set the agenda, who set what the votes will be, and they have a great amount of power. Really, he's resigning? 
That must have just happened. No, I, I, I believe you. I mean, very conservative Republicans be very conservative too. Wow, that's big. But the speaker, the speak, you know, so the speaker doesn't want to bill. Come to vote. Speaker doesn't want to bill. So, 